Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Amy Shardello. I'm the Managing Symposium Editor of the Journal of Law Reform, and we're really excited to welcome you to our annual symposium today for our fourth panel. Uh, this panel will be moderated by Professor McQuaid, and I'll send it off to her. Thanks very much, Amy. Welcome, everybody. Really glad to see you here and um, really want to acknowledge and thank uh, the Michigan Journal of Law Reform for hosting this symposium all week. Really important and timely topic on uh, the overuse of fines and fees, calling it the poverty penalty. And I think it's wonderful that we're looking at equity in the criminal justice system. So kudos to you. And I'm glad to be here with you today for this terrific panel. Um, uh, that uh, has been assembled for today. Let me start by introducing them. We have uh, someone uh, well known to our community, Professor Ellie Savitt, who is our brand new Washtenaw County prosecuting attorney. And if you have followed the announcements coming out of his office, you will see just about every day, he has made good on his campaign promises to issue new policies that address a lot of the inequities and disparities in the criminal justice system. Um, he is, uh, as I said, on our faculty here and previously served as a senior legal counsel of the city of Detroit, where he oversaw the city's public interest litigation initiatives and provided legal counsel on issues concerning the city and its executive branch. So welcome, Ellie, glad to have you here. Mm -hmm. um, next, I'll introduce Ann Stuhldreyer. Ann is the director of Financial Justice Project in the office of the San Francisco Treasurer. You know, this is one of the few silver linings of the COVID world in that we can bring people from all over the country here. And I'm glad to see the Michigan Journal of Law Reform bringing people from as far as San Francisco. And Anne, thank you for joining us. San Francisco is the first city in the nation to launch a financial justice project that assesses how uh, fines, fees, and financial penalties impact some of the city's most vulnerable residents. So uh, kudos to Anne and looking forward to hearing about her work. We also have with us from the great state of Louisiana, Professor Min Su. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Public Administration at Louisiana State University. Her research focuses on the budgeting and financial management of state and local governments. And her current research projects examine local government's use of non-tax revenue. And then finally, we have Bill Maurer, Bill is the managing attorney of the Institute for Justice's Washington office. He is a regular speaker and writer about fines and fees, and he was the lead counsel in a significant class action challenge of the use of tickets to raise municipal revenue in the city of Pagedale, Missouri. And that uh, effort resulted in a federal consent decree that reformed the city's ticketing and municipal court system. So, um, all great speakers who approach this issue from different perspectives, welcome, and we're really glad to have you all. Thank you for giving us some of your time and expertise today. Um, I want to start by asking each of our panelists to spend about five minutes um, talking broadly about how and why governments use fines and fees, and then maybe some insights from your work um, about how you've either examined uh, this practice or thoughts that you might have challenging this practice. So why don't we start with uh, prosecuting attorney Ellie Savitt um, and then uh, we'll move through the group. So Ellie. Sure, well, well, and, and thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor McQuaid for, for that introduction. Thank you to the uh, Journal of Law Reform for uh, putting together this excellent symposium. And, uh, you know, I, I really come at this from a, from a couple of perspectives. One, my current job, as prosecuting attorney, uh, but also uh, my previous job as a legal counsel for, for the city of Detroit. And I'm hoping to, to weave through uh, some insights uh, from my experience uh, around this topic uh, from wearing both of those hats uh, today. So let's, let's start with the use of fines and fees in our court system and in our criminal legal system. Uh, at least here in Michigan, a huge portion of uh, court operating costs are funded by fines and fees. It varies depending on the court, but uh, I think it's, uh, on average it's around 26% and it can go as high as around 80% in some courts of which I'm aware. Uh, now, there, now that places judges in an odd position because by imposing fines, by uh, imposing fees, that is quite literally 
how they uh, have to sustain under state law the court operations. Uh, and there was a report, uh, I think in 2019, that, that, that called out this uh, conflict of interest potentially. Uh, from a public safety perspective, and, and we've been appropriately, I think, rethinking this in Michigan, at least, this just doesn't make any sense. Because if somebody is, is getting into trouble, somebody is coming into the court system, and maybe the reason that they are there is because they were poor, uh, because they committed a crime of desperation, and our response is to impose fines and fees which aren't sensitive to economic conditions, it can really drive a person deeper into desperation, which in the end makes us less safe. Uh, and, and one thing that we've, we've done, for example, uh, that, that, that the legislature has, has recently undone, and this is very good, um, but historically in Michigan, uh, we would suspend driver's licenses if uh, you had unpaid uh, tickets, unpaid court costs. Now, when your driver's license is suspended, uh, that's a crime if you're driving with a suspended license. And then you go further into the justice system and the costs rack up and you're in further desperation with the entire reason that you were in there to begin with was because uh, you couldn't afford your, your fines or your court costs. Uh, and again, that in the end is going to cause people to commit more crimes of desperation and, and really make us less safe. Uh, so I am an opponent of poverty-based uh, discrimination, which I think uh, fines and fees often impose. And I'm an opponent from it both for, because of an equity perspective, but also because uh, I think it undermines public safety. Uh, but I want to shift and, 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 and start uh, the conversation uh, because Professor McQuaid asked quite quite rightly, well, why do uh, local units of government do this? And the truth of the matter is, you know, you talk to judges, you talk to local officials, they realize the inequity and in many ways, um, the, uh, the, the bad effects that arise from uh, over-reliance on fines and fees. They're there every day. They can see this. It's not like they necessarily want to be doing this. But the truth of the matter is, state governments, uh, often bind local units of government's hands in terms of how they can raise revenue. And you want to be able to provide services as a local unit of government, whether you're a court, whether you're a city, uh, no matter where you're at. But here in Michigan, for example, uh, we are prohibited, uh, the state is prohibited from uh, imposing any sort of a graduated income tax. Uh, so, you know, we get the income tax at the state level that we get and revenue sharing with local government is dependent on that. There's a number of laws which prohibit local units of government from experimenting with new types of taxes that aren't as directly associated with poverty as our fines and fees. Uh, you can't do stuff like impose, for example, a plastic bag tax. You can't have beverage taxes. The, the state will preempt these and it really dries up revenue sources that local units of government can have. In addition, at least in Michigan, we've got, uh, you know, we've got what's called the Headley Amendment, and I can't, in, in five minutes, uh, talk talk uh, in, in nearly enough detail about that. But what that has done is it puts on local units of government uh, as their primary source of revenue property tax uh, values. Now that's all well and good as long as property tax values are going up consistently. But as we saw in the city of Detroit. When you had a crash like we had in, in, in 2008, the bottom fell out from the system and local units of government are really starved for resources to be able to provide services. So though I think appropriately, local units of government get a lot of criticism around the use of fines and fees. And, and, and again, I wanna emphasize, I, I am opposed to uh, using this in a manner that uh, exacerbates poverty and ultimately keeps us less safe. But in my view, they are forced in many cases to rely on them because of the relevant legal landscape at the state level. So as we're thinking about this and as we're looking at reform, I think it's important to focus not just on how local units of government are doing this, but also the state backdrop against which they are operating and, and sometimes are, are, are forced to uh, look at inequitable systems in order to raise revenue to uh, continue to provide needed services. Great. Well, thank you for that, Ellie. Good to have your perspective, somebody working in government. Um, why don't we uh, move next to hearing from Ann Stuhl-Dreyer uh, from the San Francisco perspective? 
Great, thank you. And um, thanks so much for having me today. And uh, the San Francisco perspective uh, really mirrors Professor Savitt's um, perspective. Let me start out by saying that. And, uh, you know, once again, my name is Anne Stuldrer. I direct uh, something called the Financial Justice Project, which is in the Office of the Treasurer. And it's our job to assess and reform various fines, fees, tickets, financial penalties, which we found can have a really adverse and disproportionate impact on people with low incomes and communities of color, and also sometimes aren't very effective um, at helping us achieve whatever we're trying to achieve in government or the courts um, with these. They can be a very blunt instrument uh, and let me just back up and say, I started thinking about this issue many years ago when I got a ticket uh, near my house um, in San Francisco. I did not come to a complete stop at a stop sign. And I knew from many of my neighbors that this ticket was several hundred dollars. Um, at the time I was helping then Mayor Gavin Newsom, who's now the governor, start a program to automatically open college savings accounts for all kindergartners in our city. And I'd just seen this study that showed that um, if Americans had to come up with $400 in an emergency, that around half of them simply couldn't do it. They didn't have the money. So I remember looking at that ticket and thinking, I know there are so many people who can't pay this and what happens when people can't pay? Well, um, a few years later, there was tremendous community outcry in San Francisco about the heavy toll of fines and fees that they were taking on um, folks, especially folks with low incomes, people of color in our city. Um, and, you know, like that, that ticket that I just mentioned, um, you know, if people that couldn't pay it, a $300 civil assessment was added, and then people's driver's license was suspended. And, you know, that makes it very hard to get and keep a job or get to work. Um, so this you know, pattern kind of started emerging. It wasn't just driver's license suspensions for failure to pay. Um, we were suspending people's driver's licenses when they missed a traffic court date. Um, we were hearing about people's cars getting towed, they couldn't pay the several hundred dollars and then they could not, um, you know, get, they couldn't get their car back, they couldn't get to work or they did pay it and then they couldn't pay their rent. We heard about, you know, we were handing at the time people who were coming out of jail a bill for thousands of dollars to cover the costs of their incarceration. This made it very difficult for people to get back on their feet um, and, and re-enter. Um, we were also at the time, um, if you had a loved one who was incarcerated in the San Francisco jail, it could be hundreds of dollars um, just to make one phone call a day to them over the average jail stay. People were having a hard time uh, uh, paying these things. And so, you know, as we looked at this, it just seemed like such a lose-lose, both for government and for, for people. So we started the Financial Justice Project to you know, try to find a better way. And I'm gonna share my screen now, or try to. Let me just go through. Oh, I'm trying to move these forward. Oh wait, there it is. Yeah, this, this slide, you know, we've been at it for a couple years and we've done a lot of things, um, you know, to address most of the problems that I've, I've mentioned and we still have a, a lot more work to do. Um, we stopped suspending people's driver's licenses for when they couldn't pay their tickets or miss their traffic court dates. We stopped handing people a bill when they got out of jail. Um, for you know, many of our local fees. We made jail phone calls free um, and stopped marking up items in the jail store. 
Um, we created a lot of ability to pay discounts um, and right, tried to right size fines so that they were proportionate to people's incomes. And you wouldn't pay this poverty penalty um, if you happen to have lower incomes. We did that for towing, for booting, um, for traffic fines, uh, uh, et cetera. You know, and, and we've, been, we've been learning a lot. I think we've found that it is possible to hold people accountable without putting them in financial distress. We have found that we can find ways to balance our budgets, you know, in ways that is not on the backs of the least fortunate folks in our community. You know, often we have found that the revenue impacts are not that great or even neutral from some of these reforms because people just can't pay it in the first place. And sometimes we found there are better ways to achieve whatever we're trying to achieve, you know, than through, um, through fines um, or various fees. So, you know, the, just the last thing I wanna mention um, is that, you know, we've been learning a lot um, and we learn a lot from being in dialogue with folks. So, you know, we've, we've, we've authored a lot of reports and, you know, please, you know, sign up for our e-newsletter on our website, follow us on Twitter, and, you know, please, please get in touch and reach out to us. We'd love to hear about the work that you're doing. Great, thanks very much for those remarks. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Professor Min Su. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to, uh, to this panel. It's uh, my honor to be able to contribute to this very important and pressing issue. I am an assistant professor uh, that I teach local government budgeting and finance. And my, um, and, uh, I, uh, my research focuses on uh, how local governments use non-tax revenue to uh, fund uh, the, you know, uh, use the non-tax revenues. Um, so I'm going to share uh, my slides. So uh, my research on traffic citations, uh, traffic citations um, has been used as a tool um, and has been proved to be an effective tool to improve road safety. Um, however, there are, we've seen many anecdotal uh, evidence that local governments might, besides uh, improving road safety, local government might have an incentive to use this tool to raise revenues. For instance, um, in Louisiana, nine, uh, 194 um, incorporated cities uh, out of the 300 uh, incorporated cities and towns, they raise more revenues from traffic fines, uh, from fines and forfeits than from property taxes. Um, and also uh, the traffic fines is the primary funding source for Louisiana public defenders. Um, in Nevada, traffic fines provide the most uh, funding for Supreme Court, for the state Supreme Court. In 2015, a decline in traffic fines revenue almost caused the state Supreme Court shutdown. Um, and in California, traffic fines pay for over 50 uh, state funds and the programs, and many of which have um, no connection to the cited uh, traffic violation. So these uh, anecdotal evidence raise my concern that local governments might have a revenue incentive uh, for, tra uh, you know, for, for might have a revenue incentive when uh, they cite traffic fines. Uh, however, we, if we want to make a conclusion, we need a larger scale of study um, instead of depending on evid uh, anecdotal evidences here and there. So what I did is I conducted a study uh, to uh, systematically in investigate, do local governments have a revenue incentive for traffic fines? So this is a, a recent publication, taxation by citation, exploring local government's revenue motivation for uh, traffic fines. What I did is I, analyze uh, California county levels traffic fines revenue from 2004 and 2015. So what I did is to examine how um, low county traffic fines revenue respond to the um, county uh, tax revenue changes. Specifically, uh, do local governments raise traffic fines revenue after they experienced a, tra uh, a tax revenue loss in the previous year? And so what I found is county governments increased the per capita traffic fines by 40 to 42 cents immediately after a 10% um, uh, 
10 percent uh, uh, 10 percentage point tax revenue loss in the previous year. Well, in contrast, when these counties experienced a tax revenue increase in the previous year, they did not reduce traffic fines um, you know, in the following years. So how to interpret this finding? It shows that uh, county government don't use traffic fines as a revenue, as an expenditure or revenue smoother, but rather they stick to it. Um, they see it as a potential, re as a revenue source. I also find uh, some, um, you know, I also find that low income uh, counties and Hispanic majority counties raised more traffic fines. Counties that uh, generated more revenue from hotel tax, um, a, you know, a tax typically paid by travelers and visitors, they also raised the more traffic fines. So this indicated a possible tax exporting behavior by shifting the traffic fine burden to uh, the non-local drivers. Um, well, this is the finding from one study. However, there is another um, puzzle not addressed yet. How do local government's uh, fiscal stress transmit to sheriff or police department? And further, how do a local government's uh, uh, fiscal stress or budget st stress pass it on to individual officers on the street? So I conducted a, uh, another study uh, and my hypothesis is the local government's uh, budget stress is transferred to individual officers through the budget cuts to the police or sheriff department. And in that way, uh, the uh, budget cuts to the police department will transfer, will uh, negatively, negatively affected uh, individual officers in terms of, in the forms of uh, increased workload, reduced benefit, um, uh, and uh, all others. And so those individual officers will respond in a way um, that can uh, mitigate these impacts. So in the second study, I study how does a local jurisdiction's budget stress transmit uh, to uh, traffic enforcement agencies and individual officers. And in this case, um, I use a difference in difference quasi-experimental design. Well, simply speaking is I want to um, examine uh, two groups of uh, traffic officers in one within the same uh, territory, within the same county. So one group is California County Sheriff deputies uh, who directly benefited from their departments of funding allocated by the county government. The other group who patrol in the same area, uh, they are the California Highway Patrol officers. They enforce traffic um, in the same county, but they do not receive any funding from the county government. So, you know, results show that um, sheriff deputies raised more traffic fines after their department experienced the budget cut in the previous year. This budget cut does not affect the number of tickets raised by chip officers. So this uh, serves as a strong uh, uh, evidence that um, the traffic enforcement officers responded to uh, budget cuts. Um, what, how they respond is by tightening up the, their um, uh, traffic enforcement. And uh, why I, I'm confidently to say in that way, because um, traffic enforcement is a very uh, discretionary practices in many states. Uh, so state law allows officers to de decide whether to initiate a stop uh, for observed infractions. And after they stop, they can also determine whether to write a ticket or to let the offenders go. And uh, it also shows that the leniency is the norm in traffic enforcement. This is a study in a Michigan city shows that two thirds of the infractions resulted in, in verbal or written warnings, meaning that you know, uh, over two thirds of the um, you know, uh, offenders or violators, they were let go. And a national survey found the same pattern. Like um, of all the drivers who were pulled by the police in 2015, about half of them received warnings or left um, with no enforcement actions. So this shows that officers has this uh, great room, this big room of 
um, implementing uh, a big room of discretion uh, to, to, to decide whether to, um, you know, to cite or to let go. So, um, uh, and I have um, other explanations uh, as what, what state and local laws uh, encourage or permit the use of fines and the fees as a revenue source, but I'm going to save this uh, response uh, to the second question. Very right. good, thank you very much. Um, and our, our final speaker is, uh, is Bill Maurer joining us from Washington, Bill. Thank you, Professor, and thank you all for being here. I uh, regret that I'm not able to see many of you that I know in person, although I'm less upset about not being in Michigan in January. The, um, we've been talking this morning about, uh, and over the last few days, about just you know the harm that is caused by the use of fines and fees as a source of revenue. And just to review, I mean, I, I think everybody pretty much knows this, but the just some of the things that result from the use of fines and fees as revenue um, are, are criminalization of mundane conditions, uh, heavy handed and oftentimes uh, racially biased policing, courts that simply don't operate like courts and put a premium on efficiency and revenue generation as opposed to justice. And I think most importantly and most harmfully, uh, alienation from uh, of, of communities from the people that are supposed to be protecting them, uh, namely law enforcement. And as when I would uh, when I was young and my father, I would describe things I was unhappy about. My father would always say to me, "Well, what are you going to do about it?" Uh, and uh, for the my answer and uh, the answer of a lot of people uh, is, "We're going to sue." Um, and we're going to bring lawsuits. People have been bringing lawsuits uh, that have been challenging policing for pri uh, profit as violations of basically equal protection. Uh, the argument is that uh, fines and a, a system where, uh, where fines and fees are being used to generate uh, uh, revenue for municipal treasuries uh, essentially imposes a harsher sentence or harsher penalty on the poor than it does the rich. If I get a $500 speeding ticket, that's an imposition for me, it's inconvenience. For other people, a $500 uh, speeding ticket basically means they have to decide whether they're going to keep their apartment, continue on with their schooling, uh, be able to eat, be able to uh, access uh, medicine. And, uh, and I think the, the underlying these uh, challenges uh, are, is the the fact that that proposition is true. Uh, fines and fees and policing for profit do punish the poor far more seriously than the rich. But unfortunately, these challenges have been largely unsuccessful. And the reason that they've been largely unsuccessful is they have run into a method of judicial decision making called the rational basis test. And the rational basis test actually uh, pretty much describes what it is in the name. Uh, it's a test that asks if the law is rationally related to a legitimate governmental interest. The, the bottom line though, is that this test is remarkably deferential to government decision-making both at the uh, legislative and executive uh, branches. And the rational basis test essentially divides people, all, everybody, into two classes, uh, suspect, uh, into two camps, suspect classes and everyone else. And uh, cases that deal with suspect classes get real judicial decision making. There's evidence, there's uh, actually, you know, the, the, the judges are not uh, on one side. Um, and your typical, you know, the classic suspect class are, uh, is racial discrimination. Uh, uh, it essentially uh, laws that discriminate against people on the basis of the, of, of the race. Um, and unfortunately, wealth is not a self suspect class and has, that has been uh, long uh, well established in the case law since the, at least the 1960s. 
which means that distinctions based on, on wealth get the rational basis test. And being placed in the rational basis box, usually, but not always, but usually means that the plaintiff is going to lose. This is because rational basis litigation is unlike any other kind of litigation in the United States. Under it, the government's justification for its laws, its justifications for discriminating between rich and poor are taken at face value, even when those justifications are false. Any conceivable set of facts can support a wealth discrimination, um, even if those facts are false. And if the government, for some reason, cannot come up with a cover story to justify its wealth discrimination, the, the law requires the judge to do it. Um, and it, 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 it's, it, at its basic uh, level, the rational basis test uh, pretty much says, if this law is not the result of the deliberations and conclusions of a, of a uh, gibbering lunatic, then it's going to be upheld. Um, now, the actual application of this law is actually inconsistent because if that was really the standard, even though it's described that way in the case law, if that was really the standard, no one would ever win a rational basis test. Um, but people have won 20 rational basis test cases at the United States Supreme Court. But the track record, unfortunately, for challenges to fines and fees regimes under the rational basis test has not been particularly good. And the governmental policy that should be most susceptible to uh, defeat, even under the rational basis test, is the driver's license suspension or revocation for failing to, to pay court debt. This, that's a policy that's doubly irrational. If there's a governmental policy in the United States that comes close to being insane, it's this one. Um, and it, the way it's doubly irrational is it forces, it tries to force people to pay a debt that they simply cannot pay. And it does this, the second layer of irrationality, uh, it does this by essentially taking away their ability to get to work to earn the money to pay the debt that the government wants them to pay. Um, and there's no, it's not surprising that there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that driver's license suspension or revocation for failure to uh, pay court debt actually helps people pay court debt. Um, but nonetheless, this cruel and irrational system has been upheld by every federal circuit court that is considerate considered it because the courts have largely accepted the government's justification that this is that they have a uh, they they have a rational belief that this is going to help people pay court debts that they cannot pay and there uh, the most significant rational basis test case recently though did not come in a driver's license case but it came in the uh, a case dealing with amendment 4 in Florida which was the uh, ability of people to uh, be re-enfranchised uh, once they had paid all of their court debt, our, our outstanding court debt. And unlike the driver stripping someone of their driver's license, the, uh, the Florida Amendment 4 was only, had only one level of irrationality, namely that it was basically trying to get people to pay a court debt that they simply couldn't pay. But again, the court upheld this case uh, or upheld amendment for by concluding that those who can pay their court debt can be more responsible in the exercise of the franchise than those who do not. And that that's what the legislature could have rationally believed that and therefore that was good enough for the court. The given this track record, plaintiffs have, of course, tried to use a more searching inquiry to get the courts to take a more uh, serious look at particular uh, wealth discrimination in, in the criminal justice system. And you heard, uh, for instance, Lisa Foster earlier this week talk about the Bearden line of cases. And Bearden is an equal protection challenge to wealth discrimination in the criminal justice system. But it's not used, it's not a system that's used in uh, the rational, that uses the rational basis. And there's a number of cases that use what's called the Bearden 
Bearden Griffin line of cases that have used a more searching inquiry than the rational basis. The problem with the Bearden line of cases is that the uh, federal circuit courts have largely confined Bearden to simply those circumstances. Uh, essentially, if your name's not Bearden, you're not going to be able to win a Bearden case. Um, that it's limited only to that uh, the government can discriminate against you in the justice system so long as that doesn't end up with you in prison. Um, if you don't end up in prison, then the government can have a two-tier justice system, and that will survive even Bearden examination. So what do we do? Uh, this is a rather uh, grim assessment, I know, um, but I think that there's three important things that need to be done. And I think that, um, you know, as something that cannot go on will not go on. And I don't think that this can go on very much longer. We be, have begun to see the results of this type of two-tier justice system in the United States start to come home uh, in a very real way recently. And I think the, there's three things that need to be done. First, uh, the Supreme Court has to ad abandon the rational basis test in all circumstances. Uh, the rational basis test is not judging. It's not litigation. It's not a case. It's a biased distortion of the judicial process in every application. All Americans, rich and poor, deserve to have their constitutional claims heard by an impartial judicator who examines actual evidence to arrive at the truth. But until the Supreme Court corrects that mistake, uh, advocates and judges will have to, in the lower courts, uh, argue that the courts should imply a version of the rational basis test that has some teeth, namely that the court should look at evidence, that uh, people should be able, plaintiffs should be able to actually put on a case, and that judges shouldn't try to make decisions uh, for the government simply because of the government. And, uh, and I think that even under the rational basis test, you can limit it to uh, having courts overturn laws that have no logical connection between the law and the government's interest, or when the harm of the law is far greater or vastly outweighs any benefit to society. And advocates in court should also realize that the problem in Bearden was not that the, it discriminated against, the, that the problem in Bearden was that the system discriminated against the poor, not the result of the, that discrimination meaning that the, the case should really be about the discrimination, not whether you go to prison or not as a result of that discrimination. And until that happens, though, you know, it's great to have uh, Professor Savitt on the, on, the, on, the, on, on the line, too, because uh, until that happens, the, really the impetus for this is going to lay, lie with municipalities and prosecutors. And they have to recognize that policing for profit is short-sighted, and harmful to both individuals and society at large. But as advocates uh, in, in court, uh, in the social sciences, in the public policy realms, we have to continue to push judges and uh, policymakers towards a, a justice system that, uh, that, that does not discriminate between the poor and the rich to the best it can. Thank you, Bill. In the interest of time, I'm going to sort of collapse what, what was questions two through four uh, on our, our shared um, communication earlier and um, invite your comments on this. And, um, I, and I want to push back a little bit uh, to play devil's advocate here. You know, Bill, you used the, the phrase cover story for rational basis. I mean, certainly states and municipalities have a need uh, to generate revenue to um, make the system work, right? To be able to afford to have courts um, in jails and other kinds of things that are needed for the criminal justice system. Um, maybe I'll start with Anne, who works in San Francisco's Treasury Department, who uh, probably sees the real dollars and cents of all of that, um, and ask about how important are fines and fees to local budgets, and are there other alternatives for generating those revenues um, that can be used in place of fines and fees? Yeah, um, no, thanks so much. Uh, Look, you know, sitting in local government and also working in coalition with many others to 
advance state reforms in California, I feel like there's there's a lot that we can do. Um, you know, especially, you know, I think it's important to remember that there's a difference between fines and fees. Um, so, you know, fines are meant to be deterrents, fees are meant to cover costs. So, you know, for example, when I mentioned we stopped handing a bill to people when they were getting out of jail, um, you know, again, we were responding to community outcry. What we were doing at the time is we were charging people $50 a month to be on probation, but since they were on probation for, you know, typical three-year term, we were charging people $1,800 up front. We were charging people up to $35 a day to rent their electronic ankle monitor <laughs> and um, many other uh, fees. Uh, you know, we heard about how hard, you know, these, these were for people. You know, you get your first job, your paychecks immediately garnished. When we looked at the revenue from these fees, um, the collection rate on that monthly probation fee was just 9%. So these fees were what we call high pain and low gain. We stopped doing this in San Francisco. Many counties stopped doing it. And then the Governor Newsom just signed recently the Families Over Fees Act. Because again, like the it, these things just don't add up. Um, you know, in terms of the benefits that we're getting from them um, versus the harms that, that they're causing. You know, I also just, you know, looking at, you know, fines and when we stopped suspending um, driver's licenses, when people couldn't pay their traffic tickets, um, we were getting calls from all over the country, you know, saying like, are you, how, how do you get people to pay their fines? Um, what's happened to the court's revenue? Um, when we stop suspending for failure to appear, you know, are you, are people showing up for their court dates? We looked at that. There has been no impact on revenue collection at, from our San Francisco Superior Court per traffic citation. Also across California, when we got rid of this penalty, there was, um, you know, again, no impact on, on revenue collection. We still are able to get there's been no difference in court appearance rates, according to San Francisco court officials. So, you know, we implemented ability to pay guidelines, payment plans, monthly statements, better communication. So, you know, again, I just think that there's a lot of times other things that that we can do and we really need to challenge ourselves in in local government and the state government you know for all the reasons that people have um have been talking about here uh you know the math just doesn't add up um the harm from these things a lot of time is a lot greater than the little bit of revenue um that that we sometimes receive from them you know professor min su you said you were um going to hold something back in response to this question from your initial presentation. Uh, let me invite you to share that at this time. Oh, thank you. Uh, so how important, uh, you know, how important the fines and the fees are for local and the state, um, state and local budgets? Um, I, I, it, the response is it depends. And so in my research on uh, the case of California, the uh, fines, the traffic fines contributed less than 1% of the entire county revenue. Um, but, um, and I chose California, it's not because California is a classic example of local governments use uh, fines to fund their operations. Um, the, the problem is more prevalent in the southern states. Uh, the governing magazine in 2019 had a special report and uh, they found that local governments in Arkansas, Georgia, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and the Texas, um, the problem of using traffic fines to fund local governments are more prevalent uh, there. So, um, you know, it's reasonable to expect that the finding pattern from California would be even more obvious if we conduct a similar study in the Southern state. Um, and uh, also, um, uh, what kind of local governments rely more on fines, revenue, fines and the fees? Those are smaller government um, who have uh, restricted revenue source, you know, less revenue sources to, 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 to get revenue from and the poor uh, cities and towns. 
and lo geographic location matters, like small uh, towns uh, who is close to a major um, highway, state highways, they will get more uh, traffic fines. And there is a pattern that uh, some research has uh, actually found it that uh, uh, police likes to um, charge, uh, tra give citations to out of town drivers uh, for many reasons, because these are not their own local voters and those uh, passers by won't come to the traffic course and trying to dismiss the citation. Um, and also, um, uh, yeah, so it, these are my response to uh, how important a local uh, uh, traffic fines are to uh, state and local budgets. So to, to summarize, it depends. Uh, the distribution or dependence um, is not equally uh, distributed. And I, I, the thing I saved for why local governments, what are the mechanisms that local governments uh, will uh, use traffic fines. So here I have a, um, I have a short uh, a slide to share. So I, I agree with Ali. Uh, he previously said uh, local government's hands are tied uh, when raising in terms of raising revenue. Um, like a state governments uh, sometimes put restrictions on uh, what uh, taxes local governments can levy and uh, and if local governments uh, wants to increase uh, taxes tax rate or levy a new tax they face many fiscal restrictions and the rules and this is an example from California counties and see we can see that county governments face all these res restrictions these propositions that requires um, uh, you know either capped uh, the tax revenue rate tax increase rate or require voter approval. Some uh, some voter approval you need to uh, local governments needs to pass um, the majority voting, and some needs the super majority vo uh, approval. And this not only applies to raising taxes, but also raising fees and user charges and assessment. And so local governments' hands were tied when they tried to raise revenue from these uh, you know these uh, regular sources, and they're they have to look for some a creative and an easy way to um, circumvent all these uh, restrictions. And so far, there's no uh, constraint on raising traffic fines. And besides, my second study shows that, you know, a sheriff department, the sheriffs, they have the discretion um, to raise more revenues by simply tighten up traffic enforcement. And so these are the, the, the you know, the reasons that I can think of that uh, those are the mechanism um, uh, local governments were kind of permitted to use fines and fees. Thank you. Oh, why don't I give Ellie a chance to respond to that? And Ellie, if you know, I, I know our time is limited, but I would also love to hear about your thinking with regard to cash bail. I know that is one of the um, major changes that you have made since taking over as Washington County prosecutor is eliminating cash bail. And, and um, certainly that has an impact on this topic that we're discussing about a, a tax on poverty, but also I wonder to what extent um, it might have an impact on public safety. And so that, that's a lot to cover, but uh, uh, if you can share your thoughts uh, on those topics in the next five minutes or so, it'd be great. Sure, sure. Um, so, so, you know, I, I, I don't have a lot to add on the, on the, on the topic of state governments tying local uh, governments hands. I mean, I do think a lot of these reforms need to happen at the state level. And I'm a big believer uh, that if you want services from local governments, uh, then the state needs to give local governments the ability to raise revenue. Uh, and, and, and so a lot of these reforms, I think, should be made at the state level. Uh, with regard to cash bail, uh, you know, I am I am an opponent of cash bail, and and just to take a step back, cash bail is a system in which you are arrested, uh, you're charged with a crime, but before you are convicted of anything, uh, you are uh, held in jail until and unless you can come up with money out of your pocket or out of your bank account uh, to pay your way out. 
Uh, by its very terms, that's uh, socioeconomically inequitable. It means that poorer people, uh, people that uh, you know are working class, they may sit in jail for, for days or weeks or months, uh, even when they don't pose a danger to society, simply because they don't have money. Whereas wealthier people uh, are able to go free, even if they do pose a danger to the community, simply because they've got access to resources. Uh, in terms of public safety, you, you know, you, you have to look at, I think, the whole uh, system. And in many ways, the data shows that cash bail keeps us less safe because when you're holding somebody in jail that is poor or working class for even a day or two, they are likely to lose their jobs. Uh, they may lose their housing. And then you are more likely to commit crimes of desperation. Uh, the, the, the best case example that, that, that I can think of actually comes from New Jersey. And I want to preface this by saying that it's always um, really difficult to say that crime increased or decreased because of X reason and only because of X reason. That's, that, that, that's almost always wrong. But New Jersey got rid of cash bail in 2017. Uh, and what they saw actually in the immediate aftermath was crime plummeted. And the types of crimes that went down were these crimes of desperation that you might expect somebody to commit if they lost their job, if they lost their housing, if they were put in further uh, desperation. Uh, so what we're doing in the Washington Prosecutor's Office is, you know, I, we are not seeking cash bail anymore, period. But, but, but I want to emphasize, that doesn't mean that we just throw the jail doors open, because I do believe that there are people that, that have demonstrated a danger to the community and need to be held pre-trial. So what we do instead is, uh, you know, if somebody is accused of a really serious offense, uh, you know, a murder, a first degree rape, armed robbery, if they've got a, a a history of violent uh, felonies, then we will seek to hold them without bail, uh, whether they're wealthy or whether they're poor, because just as I don't want poor people sitting in jail because they can't afford uh, their cash bail, I don't want wealthy people that pose a danger to the community just able to buy their way out. It's a two-tiered system of justice. Um, we also work to recommend non-monetary conditions that can ensure public safety. Sometimes we may be comfortable having somebody go back out in the community and keep their job and keep their housing and be able to provide for their family. But we may want to say, look, uh, you've got to be on a GPS tether uh, and you can only go to work and go and go back home. And, and that brings us back to the topic of this uh, panel, which is that's all well and good, but we still have a real equity problem because the way that we fund things like tethers uh, is typically by charging the person who is outfitted with them. Uh, they have to pay, you know, between like six or ten dollars a day on average to have a tether. Now it's better than being in jail, but if somebody is in there because you, you know. And, and a lot of people, people that come through our jail system, they may be homeless, they may be in there because of a crime of desperation, then you can impose pretrial uh, conditions, but a lot of those and most, most prominently a tether costs money. So uh, th this remains, you know, even if you get rid of a, of a cash bail system, which I think is a uh, needed step because it is at its core, uh, socioeconomically inequitable, it discriminates by its very terms on the basis of wealth, but there remain these issues with how you are going to fund and whether you are putting it on the backs of somebody who may be poor, the appropriate pretrial conditions. And if they can't pay for it, where do you get uh, the funding from? And, and that's again, where, you know, at a, at a local level, uh, you know, and, and I'll say, we need to look at our, at our contracts and see if we can make sure that this is done uh, without uh, particular uh, any more onerous uh, financial burdens as possible on, on the defendant. But at the end of the day, it, it comes back to this fundamental question of how are we funding things? Uh, are we funding things through user fees or, or, or costs and the like, which are at their core socioeconomically discriminatory? Or do we want a system in which we are able to raise revenue some other way, uh, graduated taxation, for example, and then allow uh, for, for some of these services to be provided in a way that doesn't discriminate based on somebody's wealth? Yeah, and Bill, uh, do you have any th thoughts that you might want to share about uh, alternative methods for raising revenue? Well, you know, I, I think uh, Anne made a really outstanding point and a very important one, which is that um, 
this is using fines and fees as a means to raise revenue is actually a really bad policy, not just for the reasons that we've discussed, but that it oftentimes costs more to uh, administer and enforce the fines and fees regime than it recovers. I believe it was the Brennan Center uh, that issued a report recently that um, talked about the fact that the uh, attempting to track down a dollar in fines uh, cost more than a dollar uh, in actual uh, uh, you know, governmental expenditures. So this is a really bad fiscal decision. It's a bad way to run a railroad. Um, and I think that, you know, it, Certainly, that recognition would be extremely uh, helpful uh, for cities outside of San Francisco uh, to realize that this is a, a, uh, a not only a harmful source of revenue, but it's not even a source of revenue. Ultimately, it's a source of expenses. But um, I think, you know, ultimately, uh, we have to recognize that the criminal justice system is supposed to benefit all of us. And if it's supposed to benefit all of us, then all of us should pay for it. Um, and I, I think that the uh, that the public perception of how to do that uh, is becoming much less uh, um, uh, sort of uh, what's I um, can't think of the right word, but it's becoming much less sort of you know geared towards let's have all the criminals all pay for everything or you know, if they didn't they don't like it they never should have gotten in uh in trouble in the first place the fines and fees justice center just issued a uh, a public opinion survey that finds a lot that that found a, a lot of uh reforms that we've been talking about this week and that others have been talking about for years are actually supported quite substantially by, uh, by the public. And if that's the case, then, um, you know, I think bringing the argument to people that, uh, that we should all pay for a criminal justice system and that the, the system that we have now is causing more harm than good should ultimately be, uh, you know, the policy discussions that we should be having. And I think that those will be receptive, people will be receptive from that from both the right and the left, because the, the results of this are becoming abundantly clear. Excellent. Well, we are out of time. I just want to say thank you. And I'll end on a hopeful note. You know, we heard a lot of things, I think, today that can be very discouraging about problems that exist in um, our, our uh, municipalities. But um, it leaves me very hopeful that we have great minds like the four we heard from today who are focusing on this challenge to try to make the system more equitable. I'm delighted that a Michigan Law School graduate like Ellie Savitt is using his considerable talent uh, in foregoing more lucrative career options by um, doing the hard work of serving in public office and people like Ann Stuhldreyer working in a city like San Francisco that is devoting its uh, resources to solving this problem. Um, and researchers like Min Su and advocates like Bill Maurer, thank you for the work that you're doing to make our uh, justice system more fair and equitable. And thank you to the folks at the Michigan Journal of Law Reform for focusing and highlighting this issue for all of our law students to understand these issues a little deeper. I'll turn it back to you, Amy and Maddie, and for any closing thoughts. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we really appreciate your time and thank you, Professor McQuaid for moderating. Thank you, thank you. Yes, all thank you, Professor McQuaid. Thank you. Thank you.